UNDP and UNICEF. She's also worked with the European Institute of Peace, Safe for World, Penn International, and Civicus, amongst uh, a number of other agencies. Thank you for joining us, Horia. Next, we have Mr. Mark Bowden. Mark retired from the United Nations as the Deputy Special Representative of the Secretary General for Afghanistan. Uh, he was also at the time the UN Resident Coordinator, the Humanitarian Coordinator, and the UNDP Resident Representative in charge of coordination of the UN system activities. That was between 2012 and 2017. He has since then retained a strong interest in Afghanistan since retirement and is a trustee of Afghan Aid. He is also a senior research associate at ODI, for whom he's co-authored a study on Afghan NGOs and civil society. He's also an associate fellow at Chatham House and engaged currently now on a study of the application of the humanitarian principles and the ethics of humanitarian assistance. Thank you for joining us, Mark. And beside Mark, we have Mr. Mirwise Wardak. So Mirwise is a civil society leader, researcher, and former development worker with over 30 years of experience in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Mirwise has worked uh, most extensively, however, in the areas of human security, community development, peace building and conflict resolution, and also civil society development with a number of Afghan NGOs and international organizations. He's the founder and current managing director of the Peace Training and Research Organization, or PTRO, which is based in Afghanistan. Uh, and he's worked in collaboration with a wide variety of stakeholders in Afghanistan, including Transparency International, the Christian Mellison Institute, and the Danish Embassy, and also UK Aid. Mira has also studied previously in the UK, so he's uh, rejoining us here. He, and he received his MA in post-war rec uh, post recovery at the University of York in 2005. Mira? And then we have Dr. Ursula Nemat. Dr. Ursula is an Afghan scholar and think tank leader. She supported various grassroots, national and international organizations for over 23 years in different capacities. She's recently founded the Development Research Group Limited, DRG, okay, and previously served as the director of the Afghanistan Research and Evaluation Unit, it's commonly known as ARU, from 2016 to 2022. She was also previously the acting chairperson of the Open Society Foundation in Afghanistan, Dr. Namat currently serves as a trustee on Afghan Aid, which is a British charity working on Afghanistan, and she has a PhD in development studies from SOAS. That is our panel, to, and thank you to all of you for joining us today. So we're going to begin with a few comments uh, from Miriam Safi, who is the director of DROPS, uh, the lead of the Bishnau project, and also the co-author of this report. Okay. After Miriam shares her reflections with us, uh, we're going to move to our roundtable of experts and we'll end with a Q&A session, which will include a comment from our special guest, uh, who's joining us online from Kabul. During the Q&A, we're gonna have two rounds of questions. Hopefully this will work well with our online guests and in person. So the first round will be from the attendees joining us in person in the room today. And then the second round will be from those who are joining us online. So I encourage audience members joining us online, hopefully you can hear me well, uh, to put your questions in the chat during the roundtable discussions and also during the Q&A. Okay. So Miriam, would you like to begin and tell us a bit about DROPS uh, and share some of your insights with us from Bishnau, the project, the report, and what it means for Afghanistan right now? Sure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rivas. Before answering your question, I'd just like to take this opportunity to express my appreciation to Baroness Hodgson uh, for supporting today's launch and for lending her expertise to this really critical topic. Uh, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank SOAS, uh, University, SOAS, ICOP, uh, Allison, uh, and ODI for co-hosting uh, today's launch uh, with us at DROPS. Uh, Bishnau is a, is, a, is a project of DROPS, which is the Organization for Policy Research and Development Studies, and it aims to bring women's voices to the foreground in peace and conflict situations. I founded DROPS uh, about nine years ago in Afghanistan, and I'm thrilled to say that next year we'll be uh, celebrating our 10th anniversary. And at DROPS, we firmly believe that as a strong policy-oriented research institute is vital for creating healthy environments in states undergoing conflict to peace. With this in mind, DROPS was created as an interdisciplinary and independent research organization. We are committed to strengthening the values of democracy, pluralism, and inclusivity in Afghanistan. 
And in keeping with this belief, we have long argued that it is only through indigenous research uh, that is bottom up, locally rooted and representative of the diverse voices in the country, particularly those of women and girls, can these intellectual spaces be incited and be nurtured? Therefore, through our gen gender segregated data, policy analyses and specialized training in critical thinking and research methodology, DROPS ensures that citizens remain in the center of all development efforts while enabling them to become the agents of change they want to see. Since 2014, we have achieved several milestones at DROPS, some of which I just want to touch upon today. We established uh, the very first women in public policy journal in the country. Uh, we are now going to be producing, uh, launching our seven, eighth, and ninth journal this year alone. Um, we have also trained uh, hundreds of, uh, of, of men and women in critical lens, gender lens, and policy formulation. Uh, we were the co-founders of the Afghanistan Mechanism for Inclusive Peace, which was the only initiative in the country that uh, transferred local voices um, from the grassroots to the negotiation table. And of course, we have uh, Bishnau, um, our latest initiative. In recognition of some of the, the very essential and critical challenges that women have faced, both during the Republic, but also after, uh, during the Islamic Emirates, uh, we wanted to be able to create an initiative that could ensure that a group that has long been sidelined from these critical discourses um, on peace and security and development and bring them to the forefront. And what Bishnau does, it allows us to, to do that, to provide data for researchers, for policymakers, uh, and to help inform policy processes that are taking place on Afghanistan. Bishnau is a digital platform. It aims to create a more comprehensive real-time understanding of the situation of Afghan women and girls. And since, it's, uh, and since its inception in August of 2020, Bishnau has captured the views of 30,000 plus uh, uh, opinions of Afghan women across 18 provinces. The project conducts both quantitative surveys and focus group discussions with women at the provincial level on diverse issues social, political, uh, development, economic, security related. The results of these research are made available to key stakeholders and policymakers, ensuring that they're given a tool and that they're given data to help inform their decisions on Afghanistan. Since the fall of the Republic, um, our organization, which seized its operations for a period of time, uh, was able to shift some of its work to, uh, to Toronto while restarting its activities in Afghanistan. And we were able to commence our work in May of, uh, of last year. And we did so particularly with our Bishnau uh, initiative. And with our work uh, since May, we have been able to conduct a series of surveys on key issues that multilateral institutions were debating. First, we did a survey looking at women's access to humanitarian aid. And then we did another survey because we do these surveys on a bi-monthly basis. And so we collect about 2,000 to 2,500 voices um, um, every two months. Uh, then in September, in July, we looked at the security situation. And then in August, we looked at what are women's priorities. Then in October, we looked at women, how women viewed political participation under the current climate. Um, and then in, um, in, in December, uh, we looked at uh, UN sanctions, whether they were making an impact or not. And this March, we did a survey on mental health related issues. And in all of these surveys that we conduct, we provide them on Bishnau's website. They're all available, the data that can be used uh, by academics and policymakers to be able to inform the work that they're doing. And we make sure that we create a mechanism that can allow for the fluid transfer of these voices, um, particularly those women that are located in, in, in at, the, at, the, at the provincial level in very far off areas that are not otherwise um, attainable. And our methodology for Bishnau, which is... <coughs> telesurveys, 
shorthand face-to-face -face surveys and focus group discussions. It allows us to be able to not only triangulate our data and to make sure that the quantitative data is measured against the qualitative data, but it also allows us to provide a more comprehensive assessment of the real lived experiences of, of women. We are right now in 18 provinces, but by the end of uh, this summer, uh, we hope to be in actually all 34 provinces. Um, and so please do look at our, our website for, those, uh, uh, for that information and, and, and data that will be coming up. In terms of our report, um, uh, thank you, Dr. Rivas, for, for co-authoring it with us. And you've been involved with Vishnu since the very inception, uh, many, many years years ago. Um, this study is basically called a culmination of three years of work and 30,000 voices. And the mixed me method approach that we used um, help, has helped us provide um, accurate quantitative and qualitative data. Um, and it has been able to reach all regions of the country and has taken into consideration all ethnic composition, linguistic composition, as well as different backgrounds of the women that we speak to. The women that make up the, 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 the target group of our data are between 18 to 65, um, and they hail from backgrounds which include uh, religious scholars, entrepreneurs, civil society activists, uh, former government, uh, provincial level government uh, uh, officials, um, as well as human rights defenders and healthcare workers. Now, many of these women are currently not working. Some of them may be involved, particularly in the health and the education sector to a certain degree, uh, but they very much still um, identify themselves with these professions. And we were able to come up with, a, with, with six key messages that, that this data was, was, was sort, of, uh, sort of screaming to us. The first key message was women across the country, despite their level of education, social class, are politically aware and engaged in local discussions on appropriate pathways for peace in Afghanistan. So women are aware. They know of what is happening in the country. They know of the environment that surrounds them. So they can very much give informed uh, solutions to what might resolve their issues at that level. The unprecedented violence that took hold of many provinces during the first half of 2021 shifted the terms upon which women were willing to accept the peace process and led to hardening resolve towards the Taliban and the international actors involved. For long, we heard that women, particularly at the subnational level, which many would identify as being the true representatives of, of the voices or the genuine voices, uh, that they wanted only an end to the conflict and that they wanted a ceasefire. And that was the most important thing to, to them. But our surveys will show you that that was not the most important thing to them. The most important thing for women in Afghanistan was a sustainable peace process, was a peace process that reflected their aspirations and their values. They weren't going to accept any process. And that was what we were trying to show in that first year of the Afghan peace process in 2021. Feedback from women on the ground in, in 2021 provided important clues to international actors regarding the Taliban's approach to women's rights and security. We, the survey that we did one month before the fall of, 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 of the Republic showed to us that in territories that were being recently captured by the Taliban, were facing, uh, they were facing issues that included house arrests, uh, rights violations, uh, flogging, they were already banned from accessing going to school or working. And there were also instances of, uh, of, of sexual assault and sexual abuse. And this was in July of 2021. But we had been long trying to tell the international community that the likeliness and the expansion of this was going to take place. And I know my colleague, especially Ms. Mossadegh, uh, a prominent human rights offender, will talk to, will talk to this. Security has not improved in the country. Rather, conflict-related violence has decreased in recent months, but other forms of violence have worsened and new dangers have emerged. 
So the international community since last year has been telling us that, oh, well, since the Taliban have come into uh, power, there has been a sort of a decrease in, in security related incidents. And while terrorist related attacks may have been in the decline, other forms of violence have increased drastically throughout the country, not to mention the expansion of ISIS across the country. Humanitarian aid is reaching parts of the population, but it will not be able to address several needs and concerns of the population, which, uh, which are more linked to development related challenges. For women, humanitarian needs alone did not equate what they regarded as humanitarian assistance. And many of them were also finding it difficult to access humanitarian aid, especially female headed households. As a, way, a situation that we're gonna see probably worsen now that women are completely banned from working um, uh, for international organizations, including the UN. And lastly, the international community was, saw, was seen to be able to play a key role. And one of the roles that uh, a, a percentage of our respondents would, kept on touching upon was to support direct talk, talks between Afghan women in the Taliban. Just to facilitate the talks, not to direct the talks, not to guide the talks, but to facilitate a space, a safe space where these women can engage and tell the Taliban directly what are their key priorities. And I'll just ask you to just I'm actually on my closing remarks. Uh, the study, which we're which is available on Bishnau's website, and you all have received the link to it, and we'll have it also sent to you all. Um, if there's three things in particular I would like you to take away from this, is that one, there is no inside Afghanistan women's views and outside Afghanistan women's views. Our data shows that because the priorities for women inside of Afghanistan continue to remain their rights above humanitarian aid, above improvements in security, and all other issues. And those, that priority aligns with the advocacy that women who were evacuated in 2021 have been calling for in this past two years, whether it's at the Human Rights Council or the UN Security Council and in all other uh, capitals. The second thing is that that, that there is a unity in terms of the, of the voices that, uh, that we are trying to represent here. And that the, the findings that we have debunk a lot of the various narratives that are emerging in studies that are produced by other institutions, particularly institutions that are in the West. So what we find with our surveys, which are hundreds of views at a time. It's not a hundred focus group discussions. It's not a hundred uh, household surveys. These are hundreds, thousands of views that we're representing. They show to you that, uh, that security hasn't improved. Humanitarian access is not re easily available. Women's priorities continue to remain their rights and good governance and that they are not willing to compromise those for the immediate needs which is often the narratives that is being pushed, particularly by human, humanitarian aid agencies and political actors at the council. So I'd love for you to, to, to take a look at the report uh, and to just keep these two, three uh, key uh, uh, findings and messages in mind um, as you read through the report. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Miriam. Um, those are some excellent points. So now we're going to move swiftly onto the round table just to keep in time. So each of the panelists will speak for approximately 10 minutes um, to, in response to three questions that we've posed to them on the situation of women in Afghanistan, and particularly questions that emerge from the key findings of the report. Okay. I'm just going to outline the three questions and then we will move to the round table. So the first question that we asked is, uh, speaks to kind of the, the symbolism of Afghan women, right? Uh, so Afghan women have consistently been put forth by the international community as kind of a symbol of oppression and of the problems in Afghanistan. But we saw this during the Taliban reign in the 1990s and the post 9-11 era, and now since the Taliban takeover in 2021. So uh, we wanted to know, you know, what is your opinion on this somewhat or so-called, you know, people would refer to it as an instrumentalist approach. What has that kind of led to? Okay. The second question relates to um, the future of Afghanistan and really kind of the role of um, women in, in dialogues with the Taliban. So one of the things that women who participated in the research um, drove home consistently over the last two years is that the future of Afghanistan must rest with and be led by its people, right? 
But one of the key messages in the report was the desire of many women to have direct dialogue with the Taliban. Do you think it's possible in terms of organizing a cohort of representatives among Afghan women to facilitate something like this? depending on what is the willingness of the international community or different international actors and the current position of the Taliban. So given all of these things, is it possible for this to even occur? Right. And if so, in what form could this take and what role, if any, could international actors play in facilitating this? Last question uh, focuses on kind of the role of, of um, the international community and looking at kind of in different challenges, right? So the report draws from data collected from 2020 to 2022. So before the Taliban takeover to just a few months ago, right? So there's like a, a trajectory there. Right? So we try and highlight that in the report that the Taliban takeover was a major shift, but there was also continuity in some cases, right? It wasn't a, a tabla rasa, it wasn't a blank slate, right? Particularly in relation to the decreasing freedoms for women in certain areas of the country, like Miriam has just mentioned, right? The lack of access to um, aid, food, rising food insecurity, environmental challenges, and distrust of international actors. So what do you think could be one lesson learned from those past 20 years, right, for international actors? Um, the, that you think is kind of important for them to remember now, to recognize and to consider as they attempt to kind of map out their future engagements in Afghanistan and the Taliban. Okay. So we'd like to begin with Horia and then Mirwais, Mark and Orzma. Horia, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mariam Jun, for inviting me and thank you, Fiona, for having me here. So congratulations uh, on, on the report that you have done. I think I was just listening so eagerly about the findings and everything. And, and it really matters when we bring the voices of the Afghans from Afghanistan to the international platforms and, and share that. And uh, I think, uh, you know, I have known Maryam John uh, for a number of years now, but I think the work that you are doing is uh, extremely important. I think in terms of the questions that you asked, uh, Dr. Altia, uh, you know, I think, First of all, about the portraying of women as a victim, uh, I think it, it happens, uh, you know, it, it happened unfortunately in 2001 when the US and Britain wanted to justify war on terror in Afghanistan and the image that was often showed on the uh, international media was uh, a woman being shot at uh, in the Kabul stadium. And uh, that was the justification that both Bush administration and Tony Blair used for liberating Afghan women. Uh, and uh, like, uh, you know, like uh, I, I, I wouldn't say like, you know, uh, Afghan women haven't suffered in the past uh, 40 years. Uh, and I, I wouldn't say that we haven't been uh, a victim and re-victimized on and on, uh, you know, because of the whole uh, war that happened uh, in Afghanistan, particularly since uh, 1979. Uh, we have been a victim of Russia invasion. We have been a victim of all these Islamist groups that were supported by the West. Uh, and we have been a victim of the Taliban. And also women have been also victimized during the other 20 years of uh, war on terror uh, when, when uh, you know, fighting was happening across Afghanistan. But uh, saying that, it, it doesn't mean like women were just an idle, passive, uh, you know, group of people who are just sitting and waiting for Bush and Tony Blair to come and rescue them. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I think uh, that, that that perception is uh, absolutely not true. Even in the first era of the Taliban during uh, Afghan Jihad, during Russia invasion, uh, many, many years before that, uh, uh, you know, women were part of a movement. Women were trying to change the situation. And this has happened also in the past uh, 21 years after uh, uh, first regime of Taliban was collapsed uh, because of the women's movement and because of so much pressure from the Afghan women, we managed to bring, uh, you know, uh, uh, gender equality in our constitution. We managed to uh, bring a woman quota uh, for the uh, political participation in the parliament, in the upper house, in the provincial councils. Uh, and uh, like uh, you also saw, like, I think the number of women and girls that have been enrolled in schools and higher education, we, we didn't see that in the history in Afghanistan. Of course, I think uh, the last 20 years, we had so many problems also, you know, with the insurgency, particularly with the Taliban, mostly targeting women who were working uh, uh, in Afghanistan, women civil servants, uh, women teachers, uh, even girls students. But, but none of those attacks, none of those threats uh, have ever 
deterred women from fighting for their rights and, and for improving the situation. Uh, like we have made so many sacrifices, but at the same time, I think I feel uh, uh, violated or, or betrayed when, when I see that my whole image is uh, just uh, degraded to a woman with a burqa that is being uh, flocked by the Taliban. I, I don't think this is not a true picture of Afghan women who were uh, fighting for, 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 I would say for decades for their rights and also for improving the situation. Even when you see today that all those women are uh, going on the streets uh, and standing in the face of the Taliban protesting for their fundamental rights, for the right to education, for the right to work, for the right to political participation, those women know that they can get arrested, they can get abducted, they can get raped, they can disappear, they can get killed. Like so many things can happen to them, but still they are brave enough to go and march onto the streets to the face of the Taliban and, and shout uh, and, and uh, call for their rights. So uh, th these are, I think, the true pictures of uh, women that I, I really hope that I can see more and more uh, happening. Uh, so, yeah, yeah I think I, I would leave the others to maybe answer this question and then I, I will come back to the uh, other points. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, Mark Ramirez? Well, I, I think uh, to be a bit more controversial about it, uh, one of the uh, issues that struck me and uh, the importance of the report for me is uh, the importance of hearing women's voices. One of the challenges uh, I faced uh, when I was uh, running the hum humanitarian and development side of the UN uh, was uh, what I saw as the elite capture of the uh, woman's agenda. Uh, and uh, when I started negotiations or discussions with the Taliban, uh, it became uh, a major problem, uh, particularly the president's wife's role, uh, the competitions between uh, president, uh, former President Karzai uh, and, and Ghani over this agenda. So we had a highly instrumentalized agenda that meant it was far more difficult in many ways uh, to uh, mainstream uh, the, the real gender issues. And I think uh, we still face a problem uh, in hearing uh, the voices of women across the country rather than from the capital. And that's why I think this report is uh, particularly important. Uh, the panelists can respond to all three questions or any three questions. Well, I'm happy to carry on if you want. <laughs> so, I mean, in regard to... To the second uh, question about uh, uh, speaking with the Taliban and direct contact, perhaps because of my UN involvement, I should uh, perhaps outline some of the challenges that there are of engagement with the Taliban at the moment for the UN. Uh, first of all, uh, when you ask about direct contact, who is the Taliban that you're contacting? Uh, are you talking, uh, are you seeking to, to talk to uh, the Taliban in Kandahar and the Emir? Uh, even the UN doesn't have any access uh, uh, there. Uh, if you talk to government, uh, I think the challenges of government, certainly it's possible to talk to different ministries or whatever to, to engage with them. Uh, but uh, what's happening in Afghanistan at the moment, I think, is the, the somewhat inexorable uh, movement towards the creation of uh, uh, a peculiarly sort of uh, Taliban caliphate uh, with uh, the rule of ulemas and others being far more dominant within, within, within the caliphate. So uh, it seems to me that, uh, and in part, the role of the UN uh, at this stage is to, to recognize that there's a lot of diversity still, uh, both in terms of the treatment of girls' education, uh, in terms of women's employment uh, across the country, and to keep that space open. Uh, 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 and because the, the, the direct engagement, I'm not saying there's no value in it, but uh, it's unlikely to happen. Uh, the priorities at this stage, I think, are far more to keep what existing space there is open, uh, and 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 to and and to move from that to work at the uh, to maintaining the space that exists. I think uh, a, in various provinces uh, for girls' education uh, to keep the employment opportunities going, and, and also 
through the practices of, of organizations to find ways uh, of, of, of better preserving women's women's rights uh, 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 and uh, but it is it has been for the UN and I think for the international community a highly divisive uh, issue as to how to respond uh, how best to respond there uh, there's no coherence uh, at the moment within the international community in addressing this uh, quite quite honestly so I think it is uh, uh, it, it remains a major challenge. And uh, just to, to conclude uh, on uh, the third issue for, for me, uh, what have we, we learned over the last 20 years? I think the major lesson for me is that uh, the international community and the UN uh, are very bad at knowing how to build a pluralist society or to support pluralism. Uh, uh, overall, uh, we don't have the right funding mechanisms uh, to deal with uh, supporting uh, civil society in the broader sense. Uh, we uh, we didn't have the right models uh, of state building. The Taliban weren't included in any discussions for a very long time, uh, uh, and so uh, I think that the, the real. Uh, a soul searching that needs to take place because it's not just Afghanistan. I think it's it's also other countries like Somalia, Sudan, and elsewhere that there are the same problems about how to build uh, a pluralist society that better respects the role and understanding of the role of women and has sort of more uh, sort of straightforward approaches to to dealing with this best based on a better understanding uh, of models and the instrument. Utilization of the of the gender issues, both by the military, <laughs> then uh, by uh, sort of political groupings, uh, is is just a, a symptom of that. I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Um, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Santia. Uh, I think uh, the issue of Afghan women, who are always the battle cry, is not in the last twenty or twenty one years. If you look at the Afghan history, it has been the battle cry for 100 or 200 years. It's not only for the government in Kabul or uh, the international community who is supporting the government in Kabul. It has been a battle cry for those who are fighting against the central government in Afghanistan. It's been a battle cry for many radical groups, including Taliban and before them, whoever was doing social peaceful movements against the central government or uh, armed uh, 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 groups uh, uh, with them. So what uh, what mistakes we made, I think, uh, uh, that government in terms Excuse of me, could you speak a little louder, yeah. please? What, what mistakes uh, uh, we made uh, as international, I mean, international donors and Afghan government in the same time, NGOs, to be frank with you, all of us were very much busy in a couple of, I mean, three or four central, I mean, provincial, provincial centers. So women agendas hardly went out from Kabul Herat and Mazar Sharif, to be frank, I think it wasn't there in Kandahar, not, not in Jalalabad, also, I think. So, most of our programs first were designed outside of even Afghanistan for women. And then they were so short term. If you really wanted to support and, and, and build the capacity and confidence of women in Afghanistan, you need to have more, more uh, uh, long term commitment. Uh, and that was not the, the, the temper and the, uh, of international community, the donors. And the Afghan government, to be very frank with you, their uh, uh, officials in the provinces that we work with them on uh, women rights were not at all committed to it. They didn't believe in it. So whatever they were doing in, in, in Kabul was only to make the, the donors happy. And many of the donors are also not very much committed. They were only trying to have some programs have some pictures and report back to their constituencies in the West. So that was the way we, we had programs for women in, in Afghanistan. So uh, wholly going out after, after the uh, provincial capitals. And then most of these projects on capacity building, to be frank with you, even now from UN was for six months. I have been through programs where only for three months, only one workshop for capacity building for women and then leave them and come back. And, that, and the second issue uh, I found, we were doing a project with, with EU, but uh, luckily that was a long-term program. Spend more time in the community in order to, to work with male 
Malik partners to work with mullahs, with Maliks, uh, who were actually the bottleneck, uh, who were actually the gatekeepers. Uh, and to be anxious actually didn't achieve that confidence. We didn't have time to talk to them. You, you needed to spend much more time with elders in the community in order to convince them that what you're doing. So that's why I think the short-term programs, the, 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 uh, the, the short-term agendas we were there for was for, for I mean, only for a few, few months. And that's why people didn't, didn't trust the NGOs. And that's why many, many people in the communities thought that the whole women rights agenda is westernized. I remember I asked a question from some women in Herat and asked if they, uh, I mean, one of my Oxfam colleagues was there with me. She asked that if uh, somebody in Europe, a minister, a foreign minister, talk about women rights in Afghanistan, will that help? And the answer from the woman was that no, it will much more help if somebody, a legislator in the region from Pakistan or India, talk about women rights in Afghanistan. That will help a lot, rather than a foreign minister of Netherlands or Germany or UK will talk about our rights. I mean, the first, the first uh, opposition we see that in our house. I mean, our husbands, our brothers, our fathers will say, okay, these guys are not talking about your rights. Why not somebody else? So the whole women's rights agenda was much more westernized. And we didn't have much more time to work, work on it and, and actually build, build the capacity, strengthen women in, in, in the rural communities. And on the mechanism, I wouldn't go to that. I don't want to put myself in trouble. <laughs> you know, our Afghan women panelists here. I mean, as you said, I think that's right. I mean, women in the, in the rural communities, they do have opinions. They're very vocal. And sometimes they're much more better than men. Because some, sometimes men are afraid of their life and women can talk to you. Uh, uh, and uh, they have opinions, but how to bring them to the table to negotiation is a different issue. Be, be, I mean, as all political leaders, uh, uh, our, 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 our women leaders are also much more divided. But who can represent women why? In, in the Western countries or in Afghanistan. But one thing I think, I mean, right now, I think even men are not represented. Who would listen to men in God? Well, Taliban are going to talk to elders who are living in Afghanistan on peace? No. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, it might be the same with women, but uh, I think still there are, there are opportunities to talk to Taliban. I mean, the, one of the problems I saw when I was in Kabul for a year, uh, uh, under Taliban control, I was uh, on assessment on an assessment for Norwegian funding. Some of the provinces, some of the Taliban are not that much radical that we think. But I was talking to them on an assessment. Uh, I think the problem they have is that they are very much afraid of their position too. So uh, I mean, one of the uh, international NGOs in Faria had a make up capacity building program. So. Taliban were invited to come and uh, participate in the graduation ceremony. And they came. But the problem is that they, I mean, these are the Taliban that NGOs were in contact with for the last at least 10, 15 years. But the problem is that these Taliban who are moderate, who want to cooperate, were afraid on their positions. They could be easily uh, uh, dismissed by their leaders. So we all lost even the international community that who is the right person to talk to? Is it the Kanda Horshu? How you can have access to that, or is it the ministers in Kabul or the provincial governors? I mean, one of the structures that came up a number of times uh, that people thought of, I mean, some that they have talked to these or the Olamo councils at the provincial level. So we don't know the two of these people, at least they're not the, uh, uh, the armed uh, soldiers of, of Taliban. They might be the influential religious scholars that Taliban have asked it to come and sit on the provincial ulama councils, be sure people that people can talk to. I think even women can talk to. Some NGOs colleagues have gone to them. They have uh, uh, actually discussed their own issues with in particular on, on projects and they are listening to you. And the good thing is that they are the ones who can control the provincial governors. So provincial governors are somehow responsible to report to them, which is a structure there that you can do at least at the, uh, at the NGO project level that you can go and discuss with them. Uh, and for the third question, I think what we learned at least Afghans were that we didn't have one international community. We had so many different international communities in Afghanistan. So what lesson they should learn is that at least if they're not, they have, if they're not one international community, can they be on one page if they're going to negotiate with Taliban or 
between you know, the negotiation tables. So that's the problem that we had the last 20 years, that we, we had a different, we had different international communities and they were supporting different borders. From 2001 onward, I think, so uh, they actually divided up on site. They divided the warlords. They were supporting one more or another. They might be able to say that. So can we Afghan expect? I don't. I think that might be difficult. But can we ask? Please be on on one page when you're going to the negotiation table. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Rice. I think that's a really interesting point because the international community is always asking that of Afghans, right? And they themselves are not able to speak with one voice. So. Um, and then over to you, Dr. Orsla. And then, Toya, I'm going to come back to you because I think you had a few comments that you wanted to say as well to the other questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ivas, Aravis, Hudson, and uh, distinguished panelists. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here among all of you. Um, and I'd like to start with congratulating Ms. Safi and uh, all of you, the team particularly, who helps with uh, preparing this uh, excellent report. Um, and as my uh, colleagues uh, on the panel mentioned, the timing of this report is still very, very important because it just captures, most importantly, the time just before the whole changes um, experienced by women. And um, of course, what we've experienced could not be sort of, to, to sh this could not be a platform to, to, to share much more details. So I'll try to focus my comments on what has been said and uh, partly on the three questions that uh, you posed to the panel. Um, um, and although some of the points have also been covered, but just to add on the first question, whether the women's agenda or women's issue has been instrumentalized or not, I follow uh, Mr. Wardek's point to say that it is not the first time in the Afghan history in the last 20 years that the issue of women and women's rights has been instrumentalized. Um, if we consider the last hundred or hundred and few years of Afghanistan's um, sort of independence, we see quite some important parallels between what happened in 1929 and what happened in the most recent history. In 1929, um, Afghanistan's most progressive and reformist king, King Amanullah, who gained independence from this country um, in foreign policy, as it said, um, the way that the sort of revolt against him were led were framed around the issue of women. And knowing the daughter of King Amonla, I don't want to go too much into history, but it's important to just mention that here. She shared the story about the picture, a half in the Afghan context, half naked picture of the uh, Queen Soraya uh, with the dress without sleeves and all that. And she gave me the direct narrative of what happened. There was a tailor coming either from France or somewhere in Europe. So she just needed the picture of the dress that she was supposed to basically um, uh, select for herself. So this was not a picture for a public appearance, but the way it was circulated across the country in Shinwar, with my region, Eastern Afghanistan, very conservative, and the rest of the country was that here is the queen of your country. Look at how she wants the rest of your wives to be like that. Yes, we are a traditional and we are a conservative society, but so are many other traditional and conservative societies at the, at the time. So the instrumentalization started from there. Now, 100 or so years on, we know the reasons for that sort of collapse or revolt. We know who were behind it and we know how it was influenced to bring a level of equilibrium in the, in the sort of society and the way that things followed for 40 years. But the point here that I wanted to highlight is that the issue of women and the traditional or conservative societies always are uh, instrumentalized, but probably Afghanistan is a unique experience where it has been kept repeated on, like uh, even up until today. Now, the point regarding, um, uh, regarding uh, Afghanistan and what best represents uh, and when, it, when it comes to the instrumentalization of women, the Taliban are also instrumentalizing the issue of women. The same way it has been instrumentalized in 2001, like uh, Ms. Mossadegh mentioned by the George W. Bush and Tony Blair, saying we go to liberate the Afghan woman, um, Laura Bush mentioned that actually. The same way Taliban say, oh no, we also, we are the actual representatives of Afghanistan and we want to denounce that. 
And the reason we, or generally women in Afghanistan, suffer now is because of that. It's a counter reaction to that type, type of liberation, quote unquote, liberation, liberation that <coughs> was framed. So Taliban are coming to another extreme. And what I always reiterate in my conversation, most of us are reiterating in our conversation, that the Taliban's acts and actions are not linked with the Islamic principles nor is it linked with the Afghan traditions and customs. Yes, we are conservative. Yes, we are traditionalist. But you go to the <coughs> most conservative part of Afghanistan, and Bishnau is an evidence to that. You would find out that people are looking for schools for their girls' children. You will find out that people, that the most traditional Afghans appearing exactly like the Taliban in the way of, that they dress, by the way. That's the only way I, I see Taliban as most Afghan. The way they dress are more traditional than many of other Afghan men. But when it comes to thinking, the thinking in Afghanistan has changed drastically in the last <laughs> 20 years. Because the most conservative traditionalist men in Afghanistan are concerned today about girls' education, whether they are religious scholars or they are traditional leaders, they are local uh, sort of influencer, or they are just random men sitting at home. Nobody, nobody, including some of the Taliban, as Mr. Wardak mentioned, agrees with the Taliban rules on education. Why they are putting women's education into, into this level of restriction? This is their bargaining chip against the international community. So the, the question of instrumentalization is quite wide and used by different parties. And unfortunately, like we say in Afghanistan, the powerful always has the more influence over the powerless. And women at this point have left with, uh, with nobody behind them, have, have left uh, literally not women, our own country is literally handed over to this group that everyone knew their policies and their perspectives towards women. So uh, when it comes to um, the, the point of, um, I'm still like on the question now, uh, question one, I'm sorry if I go a bit longer, uh, but I think it's also very important. So in this whole question of instrumentalization, we have to look into the other side of it, which I think sometimes the whole, the international community, even Afghan society is overlooking at it. That's the agency of women. So if today, in spite of all the restrictions, in spite of this, a level of what is called gender apartheid, because literally women are denied of education, they are denied of their basic rights. A lot of women, I cannot say it's a general blanket restriction like it was in the late 90s, but still, for example, women in economics are still having the opportunities to basically to, to, to work. But this kind of uh, restrictive uh, rules did not stop women from working. So there are things happening as we speak. You could see women walking on the streets. It's not like, like before, like dressing in all different ways, but I mean, of course, covered, but that's, that's accepted and nobody feels imposed uh, when, when it comes to covering and stuff. But the most important point is to consider or make note of the agency of women, meaning their inter-solidarity, meaning their uh, non-violent forms of resistance that is taking shape within the country across, you know, different provinces, you see women are gathering either to celebrate Women's Day or to denounce some of the rules that are being, or finding negotiate, negotiated ways, which moves me to the second question on, on whether there is a room for dialogue in negotiations. I'll just say, Dr. Rosa, um, it's really fascinating, but you have about two minutes. Oh, I will just summarize it. So women peace committees that are mentioned in the Bishnau report are a great example to show that there are room for dialogue. And in general, based on our observation, or at least from the research and work that I have done, I find more women more active and more significantly active in the nonviolent forms of um, sort of means to peace. And this is highlighted in the report. This is also what we see in the, in the, uh, in, in the context currently happening. The only question is when it comes to the political participation, other forms of negotiations and dialogue is happening as we speak on the daily basis, the work that women do, they find their ways. They don't need international community. Practically, the international community didn't help in the way that women found their ways to be able to work, live, and find some sort of solutions to the situation. When it comes to women's political participation, tell me one place where a hostage is negotiating with the hostage taker. 
the only thing you can negotiate is, okay, can I drink? Can I go to the toilet? Can I just go out to, to a doctor or something? Even in that, there are restrictions depending on context and region. So it is a very difficult and complex situation. Uh, and uh, using my last minute for the question number three, uh, everyone said one lesson. So what I would say one lesson that we learn is to find out a way for the international community to bring women to the table and do not speak on their behalf. Afghan women are always spoken about. There are less efforts to bring women on the table to discuss whether in Afghanistan today, when there are UN discussions, when they're meeting with international agencies, uh, Mark and I are both part of an um, uh, ethical dilemma report that is shortly going to be launched. And in that report is also reflected that women uh, headed organizations are complaining about this question that why we are not in invited and included in meetings. The excuse is that they, for their own security and safety, if women themselves decide about and assess their own security and safety, why they are not included. So we have to find ways to go beyond the ruling of a restrictive regime in order to sort of open the space for women to, 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 to represent themselves, their concerns, and make sure that they are also um, and included in the conversations. I stop here, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nimat. Uh, and then, Horius, do you want to make a few comments? Because you only have this question one, I think. <laughs> okay, sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, uh, about the access to aid, uh, uh, I also I did uh, research just towards the end of 2021. Unfortunately, since Taliban have returned, the number of like uh, poverty among women has significantly increased. Uh, and also, let's mention that since Taliban took control towards the end of 2022, uh, more than 120 decrees were issued by the Taliban that were restricting women. And uh, those were issued whether at the provincial level or much more broader at the national level. And in all those decrees, uh, whether it was from going to gym, to parks, to restaurants, to, to the bigger picture, which, you know, the ban women from working for UN or uh, other humanitarian agencies. So I, I think in, in, in such a situation, you know, uh, what we were really expecting that there have to be a collective uh, solidarity among the international community uh, in the United Nations and others who can stand for the women's right. But now it seems that even the United Nations is okay if the women are not working. United Nations is fine if next time Taliban will say, okay, we don't want you to have any Hazara staff member. And then the United Nations say, yeah, that's fine. We will not have Hazaras. And next time they will say, okay, we don't want you to have Baluch. Next time they will say, we don't want you to have Tajiks. And next time they will say, we want you to have a particular group of Pashtuns to work with you in the United Nations, but not that tribe or this tribe or from that province. And then the United Nations will say, okay, yeah, that's fine. As long as we can get billions of dollars from the international community to continue with our humanitarian aid. I think what I really, I also feel really betrayed is the response of the international community, particularly the United Nations, when it came to the banning women from working as, uh, you know, uh, humanitarian and aid workers. Uh, I, I think this is absolutely pathetic and disgraceful uh, for uh, institutions such as United Nations to act in that uh, cowardly way. Uh, and, and second, you know, I would also say, like, you know, what I also have seen in the past uh, 20 years from the international community, like what uh, my colleagues were saying, you know, like uh, it is not just that they never came with a consolidated voice, but also what we have seen, like different players are playing different uh, games uh, with us. Like, for example, United States, when it came to the peace negotiations, they absolutely sidelined Afghans, whether it was Afghan people or Afghan government, and, and they engaged in, in a direct negotiation, which resulted in the collapse of the republic. The collapse of the republic was not accidental. It was planned. It was part of the deals. It was it, 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 it should have happened and under that peace deal that you, uh, you know, US and, and Taliban have signed. So uh, like what, what we have also seen is uh, also the role that you know have played. I remember like in those months that were leading to the uh, collapse of Kabul, uh, the UNAMA was denouncing us as city women, elite women. And let's talk to the actual women who are living in the rural areas. 
you know, and, and they were totally dismissing us and even in some issues because what we, what we were calling, we were calling for the red lines. We were saying, yes, we want an end to the war, but at the same time, we want us to have a red line. We want us to know what we are losing and what we are achieving. When we kept warning the international community that Taliban have not changed, and if there is any change that changes for worse, we were also branded as war campaigners. So uh, unfortunately, that didn't come only from the governments. I still remember that some expatriates, some Western expatriates, you know, whether they were working for Oxfam or they were working for uh, you know uh, other uh, humanitarian agencies, they were so much against us. Even you know, they, they would just go around and telling people lies about us. Uh, unfortunately, I think the whole scenario was built in a way to sideline Afghans. And, and, and to lead us to the, to the situation that we are now. I think this situation doesn't serve Afghans and Afghan people, but it serves so many others. Like look at the United States, they are giving $14 million of cash every week to the Taliban since the government has collapsed. They never did that with the Republic. They never did that with Karzai Urghani's administration. But that you're doing that so willingly to the Taliban, why you're doing it under the humanitarian aid? How much of that money really, really goes to the humanitarian aid? That money is used to feed the Taliban soldiers who are going around, who are not only implementing the worst forms of violence against women and men in Afghanistan, you're committing war crimes in Afghanistan on a daily basis. There are extrajudicial killings that are happening on a daily basis in the places where armed resistance is happening against civilians, not only against people who, are, who have picked up a weapon and fighting the Taliban. So I think what I really expect from the international community, just for once, if they can have the gut, if they have the, uh, you know, like the face to just come and tell us the truth that we don't care about human rights, we don't care about women rights, everything is about our own political and strategic gains, and that's it. We always use human rights and women's rights as a cover-up to, you know, to protect ourselves. Other than that, I don't believe in United Nations, I don't believe in International Criminal Court, I don't believe in any of these governments, Western governments, who are going around and saying they are there for human rights. None of them are for human rights. If they were for human rights, I think Afghanistan was a perfect case that now all those war criminals should have been tried by the International Criminal Court, and Afghanistan would have been in a very different place that we are now. Thank you. Good point. Very good point. Very good point. Excellent. And now... Um, but we're going to ask uh, Alison Davidian, who's online uh, as our special guest, and she's joining us from Kabul. So she's the UN Women Afghanistan representative. Uh, and Alison, I wonder if you could just share a few of your thoughts on some of the key messages of the report, anything that's been said today, and the situation in Afghanistan. We're running a little bit behind time, so. You know, just Yes, absolutely. Um, I'll be quick, but uh, I'm having some issues putting my camera on, or maybe you don't need my camera. That's fine. Just go go ahead. You can hear you fine. Okay, excellent. So I just wanted to touch on a few things that were said. Um, but first of all, uh, let me really congratulate Drops um, on this report. Uh, Drops is a key partner for you and women uh, in Afghanistan. And as we go forward and try and, and navigate our way through these unprecedented challenges, what is critical is that we listen to the voices of Afghan women, and I think this report is a real reflection of that. Just to touch on a few things that were said, um, first of all, I think, um, Mariam, your comment uh, about debunking a lot of myths, one of them being this division that we often hear about women inside the country and women living in exile, um, that that actually was not reflected in, in the report. Um, that there is a unity of voices and views and that women's priorities continue to be about their rights and about good governance. And no woman is willing to trade that away um, for humanitarian assistance. It's not either or, it's both. I think that's important. Um, second thing I wanted to touch on is something that Horia and uh, Dr. Ozala also uh, mentioned is that 
uh, we, Afghan women are, are not victims. Uh, the history of Afghanistan is a testimony to what women and the women's movement have been able to achieve. And Ahoria touched on gender equality being sh enshrined in the 2004 constitution, the quotas of women in parliament, um, the numbers of women and girls in school are uh, increasing. Uh, but it's not even the, it's not just the last 20 years, it's, it's centuries. Afghan women got the right to vote in 1919. This is before women in the US got the right to vote. The first school for girls was set up in, in 1921. The 1967 constitution enshrined, uh, equality, uh, before the law. Um, and, and every day now women are out protesting. They're setting up underground schools in their homes. Uh, they're still setting up organisations and they're going out to deliver services for women in the face of incredible obstacles. I think what this points to is the need to continue to invest in women leaders, in women's organisations. I think nothing challenges the Taliban's vision for society more than putting money behind the very parts of the population that they're seeking to subordinate. Okay, thank um, you very much, Alison. I'm going to have to... Uh pause it there just because we only have nine minutes left uh, I think for question and answers so thank you for your comments uh, if you have any time at the end of this, um, all of the people who are here online and in the audience also a chance to comment okay. so I'm going to move to the Q&A now um, yes so let's open it up to the audience we're going to take a round of questions from the audience and then if there is anyone online that would like to uh, ask a question you can uh, write it in the chat and let us know if you'd like me to ask the question or if you'd like to ask the question yourself. And since we are uh, short on time, I would like to ask people to be direct and short with your questions as well. Joining us today. Okay, Ed, can you just remind us of your... Yeah, sure. I'm Raminka Helic, a member of the House of Lords. I, um, I wanted to ask that Two particular issues. One is everyone is talking about localization and need to uh, empower and to ensure that the local people take the lead uh, and that that uh, international organizations in particular that have been so ineffective or so they say take the second uh, they, they don't take the lead the lead in, in, in implementation of whatever projects on the ground. Now how possible is it to have localization in a situation where particularly women do not have power to uh, pursue any of the, of the sort of projects on the ground and how much in order to achieve that, how much of compromise should we or ought we to make with the Taliban leadership, whatever that, wherever the leadership is, whether it is sitting in Kandahar or in, in, in Kabul or Mazari Sharif or whatever, how, how do we do that? Because it's, a, it's, a, it's an admirable sort of goal to have, but it's entirely impractical. Or so it seems to me sitting here. Thank you. Okay, and then I'll take three questions if possible. Uh, please introduce yourself. So Manzilla then from the House of Lords also. Um, I just want to make a couple of points. Um, thank you very much for uh, the, your passionate um, representation of what's happening about uh, women of Taliban, uh, sorry, women of uh, Afghanistan, particularly now under the Taliban regime. And I want to particularly echo the comments that you made and your analysis. I mean, I don't want to repeat them. I just want to say I agree with so much of your analysis and um, the comments that you've made. We've abandoned Afghanistan and we forget in our current trajectory that we abandoned Afghanistan, but before that, we were occupying Afghanistan for a long time under these pretexts. And I think that is, is so abhorrent to me. And that's why I almost want to stop going to these meetings. I come to these meetings, honestly, from my heart in solidarity, because I want to be here. But the, the, the abject failure of us, and we are responsible for what's happening here in Afghanistan. We are responsible for what's happening in Palestine and Syria and so many different places. And unless and until we really have our voices heard in that sense, and I'm telling you, 
voices like mine are alien in, in this place. So, and I've been here 25 years, uh, said many similar things. Uh, and so I think, how do we mobilize the voices that you have, the, the trajectory that you want parliament to understand and implicitly, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, impose and not impose and, 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 and lead on? How do we make sure that we're working together to be heard properly so the changes are occurring and not the same bloody narrative that's been going on for 50 years and 100 years is still going on now, particularly with regards to Mr. Moment. Thank you for those comments and reflections. Uh, there's, there's, there's two more. Uh, so I'll take you together, but just be short. Is there Sure. And then, should I go? Yeah, and then. Yeah, I'm Mariam Faruqi, I'm a lawyer and management director of a legal organization called I Pro Bono. Um, firstly, this report is really exciting because I feel that people like us can use it as a tool. So I wanted to ask a question about the collection of your survey data. And you mentioned that you know you worked across 18 provinces. And I'm just interested to know how you accessed the people to fill in the actual data, so it's a very practical question. And if it's okay, a really second quick question. We work a lot with Afghans between the ages of 18 to 21, mainly in India, Pakistan, and also in the UK, come across to Europe and other countries. So I'd be really interested to know how you are all engaging with the young diaspora, the new diaspora of Afghans who also want to go back at some point. Um, so I'd be really interested, to, and it's young men and women um, that I'm thinking about here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Mustafa Safi. I'm the humanitarian advisor with Bond. So as you have seen that the international community, including the UN agencies, have failed massively in bringing peace to the country. So I'd like to ask you, what's the role of the community leaders in terms of bringing peace to the country and also prevent the conflict, including bringing women to work and also girls to schools? Thank you. Okay, so anyone else? I'm going to just take them all at once because it's just going to be this one. Yeah. I got me here in two spaces. One, the responsibility to rebuild, reconstruct Afghanistan and keep the women front and center of it has been put on back on your shoulders, the Afghan community shoulders to fix this. There is a, there is a distinct risk. I'm uh, sorry, I'm Neelam Rena. I am from the APPG on Afghan women and girls. Uh, and uh, there is a distinct movement from looking back at 2021 and why it happened. And when you start digging in that direction, you come up with these responses of we have lessons learned in brackets moving on. How are we not repeating? What can we do to not repeat the deletion of the past of failures with the moving on report? And how are we going to deal with single-handedly having to rebuild off the back of the mistakes of others in your back in your back here? Okay. Thank you very much. So we had uh, four, five questions or four questions and comments. So uh, let's the panelists respond to, you don't have to respond to all the questions because we don't have time for you to respond to all the questions, but you can uh, respond to whichever ones that you would like. And I think we will start with Dr. Uh, Forsler and then we will end with Miriam. But sure. Sure, thank you. Um, on the role of, um, uh, on the localization, I'd like to pick up if, the, if it's okay. And just one quick comment regarding earlier um, remarks as well. Uh, the Taliban, I mean, the, the very quickly, the way to look into the Taliban and the way they lead or manage the country, there are two, two branches sort of developing in there. There is a little bit of an infight in terms of the territorial sort of domination and the exact uh, execution of the orders that are coming from the supreme leader. So the executive, the way that I look at it, the executive part is the Kabul sort of administration of Taliban and the line ministries that are sort of linked to the provincial governor, district governor level, and the, the line ministries from each ministry that are represented. To some extent, this executive branch of Taliban are quite collaborative, cooperative with women-led organizations, with women programming, to some extent. And some of them were harshly punished, going a little bit out of the line, as you like. So when the top leadership of Taliban realized this, and according to my reading, they started to create these ulama councils. So almost, uh, if I'm not wrong, almost over 27 ulama councils already established. 
And the way that the Ulama Council is working, I mean, I like that you are relatively optimistic, but I'm a bit concerned because, yes, there will be local ulama also part of these, uh, uh, ulama is like religious scholars, basically. Uh, uh, part of the local councils may be part of this sort of uh, leadership of the uh, provincial ulama councils, but these councils will be directly linked and there will be specific representatives from the Supreme Leader Kandahar Shura into these. So this is... The, the attempt of the supreme leadership of Taliban to control the provinces, because maybe they get concerned that their orders are not, and this is probably a, a response to, to the education you know, opportunity where six, seven provinces were able to manage to keep the girls into the school as opposed to many others who, who didn't. So the localization from the Taliban side is this level of increasing control of the supreme leadership and the way they execute their orders and sort of like run the, the, the system. From the, from the UN point of view, there are issues because the, yes, they have mechanisms to work, but this mechanism so far is not really functioning well. At times, there are much more problems at the macro level in the provincial level than there are in the micro level because micro level with the dependent on the community leader, some influential, they find their way to work. When it comes to formalize an official, it's a block and it doesn't work really. I have comments on the others, but I think time is short, so I let others do. Yeah, shortly also on the localization thing, I think when one of the uh, approach we had at the CDC, I was uh, in Fari, I will go back to that example. I think one of the main problems I talked to many NGOs, the international NGOs, was that CDCs are not anymore recognized by Taliban. They feel that they are the previous government people and we would uh, replace them with that. And in some areas they had requested that at least the head of the Shura should be a mullah. Uh, but uh, different angels, I mean, all these five angels I visited, they were actually uh, NSP, National Solidarity Program implementers, but they had abundant CDCs, they had their own approaches now. Like one of the uh, acted, I think, had a different approach, they call it Mantika approach, where they had a bigger shura of, in, in the community. Uh, but the problem is now that uh, uh, I'm working on a research project with Ursula, I was looking for the uh, uh, research uh, uh, questionnaires and the uh, data we have got. I think someone has tried to control everything. Uh, uh, now, even for the humanitarian aid, the Malik, the village representative, is actually have to go to the intelligence department to be approved. And that guy is now uh, actually presenting the, the, the village, and then they're all involved in aid also. And on the other side, I think there is, I mean, there is opportunity as long as the international community, particularly you and NGOs, would commit themselves and have time for that to establish these CDCs again. If it's not on that I mean, the bigger, bigger structure, I, I mean, small village structure, so they can have maybe some four, five, five, six villages together to have a CDC where they can come and use it, and both in development and humanitarian aid. But the problem is that you and, and NGOs are in Russia. Mm -hmm. They get six months, three months uh, contracts in the the communities, they uh, distribute the maintain aid and come back. So nobody has time, nobody is committed to go back to our villages and re restructure the communities. I mean, re reestablish CDCs, where, uh, because that will, I mean, if you have proper CDCs, if you have proper village structures, then you and, and, uh, and the Afghan angels, international angels, would have the county, but they don't want to do that. Uh, I don't I think if there is commitment and there is, uh, I mean, uh, some have a, a, a long-term program, I think it's easy because the, the thinking of CDCs and community structures is there. We have worked for that last year. <laughs> that thinking is important and people know that. In many communities I visited in Fargo, I mean, the lead people were coming to the district centers where they were they abandoned those, those villages because of the war. But the first thing they were trying to do to have a CDC, so they thought if you have a CDC, you will have access to your entire aid. So that thinking is there and people would like to have that. But the problem is with the international community and, and the NGOs. Uh, Mark? Uh, yeah, perhaps, uh, I think the localization issue is being covered. Uh, perhaps just to uh, try and clarify one issue, which is uh, uh, about the role of the UN, because I think that the UN is facing uh, some uh, very serious ethical dilemmas and and i think we need to understand that afghanistan poses ethical dilemmas which many of us are not actually uh, equipped to cope with but uh, amongst these is this whole issue which has come up about the currency and i just want to clarify that particular role because the money is not going directly to the taliban 
what's happening is that money is provided into the AIB uh, uh, and is used for aid purposes. The purpose of giving the money is to keep the currency stable. And, uh, you know, this is another ethical dilemma. Do you want to have a, a collapsed economy uh, uh, or, or do you want to keep a degree of stability? So the, the real challenges are about the compromises that need to be made uh, for, the, uh, for the UN. And at the moment, I think uh, the other issue facing the UN, you know, is, is whether there is value in its role there or, or, or not. And it's a very critical time at the moment in, in those terms. Thank you, Mark. That's a really important clarification. Okay. Well, uh, I don't know what I can add after you know, <laughs> everything said by my uh, colleagues. I think but I really want to use this platform to call on the UK government, you know, to abide with the promises they made in 2021 by saying that they will allocate 20,000 visas for the Afghans at risk, uh, 5,000 visas every year on humanitarian visas. Unfortunately, so far, nothing has happened. Last year, I think uh, just a couple of hundred people were relocated. Uh, and uh, so far, I think with the current policy of the uh, tourists, uh, I don't think we will have much success in bringing uh, Afghan, particularly human rights defenders, journalists, and uh, uh, lawyers, judges uh, who are uh, under uh, immediate risk uh, to the UK uh, and resettle them. I think this is uh, one of the issues that uh, I really hope that uh, some of the members of the parliament who are here, we are not asking for anything more. It's just the promises that uh, Boris made, uh, I think, it, it just to abide with those promises. And, and second, I think you have mentioned about the humanitarian aid and how you can support the local organizations. The FCDO, much of the funding goes to the international organizations. They barely support Afghan organizations. They barely support organizations that are you know, like uh, working directly with the other uh, Afghan organizations inside Afghanistan or with the Afghan constituents inside Afghanistan. So I, I think uh, this is also something that you can definitely, you can raise with the uh, people at the FCDU and also other members of the parliament here can uh, raise that. And this is another way of helping. Like you said, how is it possible? We are Afghans and we always know how to do things by maneuvering uh, around. Like uh, I'm at the moment working inside Afghanistan. Urzala John is working, Mariam John is working. And so many of us, we, we have our constituents, we have organizations, we have people across Afghanistan from south to east, from north to east. And, and uh, we are working with women, with men, with youth. But what, what is really important that, you know, we also need means in order to continue our support. Uh, of course, I think supporting Afghan organizations will be much, much cheaper than, you know, uh, working with the international organizations. I, I don't say that don't support international organizations, but also don't forget the Afghan organizations as well. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Um, and yeah, that was a really important point that I think Mirai also made in terms of, you know, the type of support that can be given and who's really doing the work uh, anyway. And then uh, Miriam, so we just have a few minutes left. So we'll have Miriam and then uh, the band will provide a closing for us. In terms of uh, localization, um, I would also ask uh, Ms. Uh, Davidian, maybe if she wanted to provide a, a 30 second remark on that, because UN Women is doing quite a lot of work under very difficult situations to, to do exactly that. Um, and in terms of, I'll just answer the question of, of access to the data that we have. So we started our work in 2020. So we started gathering telephone numbers, contact details of women in the five, six sectors. And we were able to do that through a referral system. So we contacted civil society organizations in the provinces and had them become a part of the initiative. And then they would refer women in those sectors to us. So by the time, May of 2022, and we were able to begin again, we already had a database. Now, this database tends to go up and down. So sometimes some months we, we lose about 1,500 to 2,000 numbers because there are women who say, who either don't pick up anymore, who are uh, not in the country anymore, or who cannot speak to us anymore. So while we're also calling, uh, because we gather our data through telesurveys, shorthand face-to-face -face surveys at the provincial level and uh, focus group discussions through our women's peace circles uh, that exist in 11 provinces. And so uh, while we do that through, through our database, uh, we're also continuously gathering 
new referrals. Now that has become so much more challenging, but we need to, otherwise we will not be able to replenish our database. And we chose to go with the referral based system because if we were to collect um, uh, telephone numbers in any other ways, and you can do that several ways of using different formulas to be able to, to, to call, we needed to ensure that the women we're contacting are in the provinces they say they are and that they are and that those are the numbers of women. So that's why we use the referral system, referral system to do that. And when we ask our survey questions uh, by monthly, there are only four questions. We don't go more than four questions. So it's only four questions via tele-survey, four questions and the face-to-face -face shorthand surveys. And then our focus group discussions, of course, are take a different format. And the report, yeah. if you have a copy, or I guess people will be sent a we'll copy. have that a, a detailed yeah. section on the methodology yes. and the approach. Do you have the web address of the report for everybody? Yes, Mary. Yes. Bishop. And actually, the Bishop okay. website is. Um... Yes, Chris is right there. Chris is the website. Okay, and then I guess we will ask Bernice to. Uh, Alice, oh, Alison, would you like to make a few comments? 30 seconds on localization or something you probably can't speak to in 30 seconds. Um, sorry, I, the connection has been going in and out uh, for the last little while and I missed the question and I guess I've used my 30 seconds. Um, if, you, if you're able to repeat it, but if, if not, uh, if you want to put in the chat, I can respond in writing. Um, maybe responding in writing might be good. I think actually the person who asked the question has also left, but uh, the question was just, is localization possible right now given um, that women cannot work for NGOs or the UN? So. But if you could oh yeah, I would say that localization is the only is the only answer right now. All right, thank you. That's that's good. <laughs> thank you to our panelists, and I would like to hand it back to Baroness Hodgson uh, to close. Well, thank you. I think we've had the most fascinating hour and a half. I'm not even going to begin to attempt to do a sum up or anything else, but I think it's been fascinating to hear from all our speakers who were so honest with us. And I think, I think you know, obviously what's happening has been heartbreaking. And my heart goes out to all the Afghans who are here and who participated. I'd like to thank um, the, 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 the creators of the Bishnal report, because I think that will really inform, we need to listen to the voices of Afghan women here and on the ground back in Afghanistan. So really it's just to thank Althea, who's, who's brilliantly guided. <laughs> And I'd like to uh, reiterate the thanks to the panelists, and I'd like to thank the audience and everybody who's asked questions. Thank you for coming. We must, we must not let the whole issue of Afghanistan slip off the international agenda. So thank you all for, this, uh, for a fascinating and quite heartrending afternoon, to be honest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.